Hello, thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura, and today I am joined by my brother, Joe. Joe hello, Martin. hello. Great to be on the show again. This is, our, I think, our third podcast. Yeah. So, so All Quiet on the Western Front was our last one. Joe is the reason I read the Dune books, because I usually don't like fantasy. And these are sci-fi, but I feel like they're sci-fi fantasy, where it kind of is blending the genres. Because I think of sci-fi as like Philip K. Dick, where it's more based in reality. You yeah, know? well, it's also so like philosophical in a lot of ways. And I guess a lot of times I think of like young adult, kind of that genre. But this is definitely very much adult fiction. I, I think as a young adult, you could potentially get into this, but there's it's very dense for sure. And he wrote this at a much older age. You know, he'd already had sort of a career. And so a lot of that kind of shows through, I think, in the books. Yeah. And so I have now read the first three books. And yeah, so I just wanted to start out. This will be broken up into the timestamps down below if you want to jump around. But to start, I wanted to just share our spoiler free thoughts on the books and the series. And if we think they're worth reading for people who are fans of the movie, for example, or if you liked the first book, is it worth it to read the other books as well? So I will have Joe kick it off. So you have read the first six, kind of. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, just kind of stumbled on the original Dune book at a store and I was like, man, I really want to read this. And so I went ahead and got it and I watched the movie. I liked it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and uh, get dive into the book series. So the original Dune is really good. I think it's the best sci fi book I have ever read personally. Um, definitely one of the best fiction books I've, I've ever read personally as well. Uh, and then Dune Messiah is actually my favorite book in the series. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because kind of like what you've talked about, there's like a Messiah trope that is leaned into really, really heavily in the first book. And so you, you kind of have an idea of where it's going and where it's going to take you. And it's very fulfilling and it feels like satisfying, but you're kind of curious to be like, okay, well, what's this author going to do now that he's already set the stage and what's his vision for the actual character? So that's why I like Dude Messiah because it is a little bit sort of non-traditional in the storyline. And Dude and Messiah, I did read that when it came out. A lot of people didn't like it. And it has way less action. And oh, right. like Dune and Children of Dune, it feels like there's so much going on. Whereas Messiah, it's a lot of conversations kind of. Right, so. right. I really like Paul's character, which I think is funny. I think most readers really liked Paul. And it's almost like the Sherlock Holmes thing where like this author creates this character and they become something that's not exactly what they'd intended. And so there's this desire to sort of claw it back. So I still enjoy Like I said, I, I thought Dune Messiah was really, really good. And just really the first three books as you're following, you know, his character, I think it becomes really interesting. Children of Dune is what, what, what I'll say about Frank Herbert is I feel like his character development gets like worse over time. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think I wanted, this is one of the things I want to talk about when we get into the, the kind of the book and the movie, but like Shawnee's character, there's really no development of her character in my opinion. And so you kind of start seeing that in a lot of his other books and a lot of his other books get really short. And so what you're losing is like all his character development. And so by the time you get to book four, really the only one you feel like is being developed is like the Leto character. Everyone else you're like, like, I don't know what motivates them. I don't know what their character arc is. By book five and six, I just, I felt like I didn't care about the characters as much. And then book six is where I stopped. I mean, that's Frank Herbert's last book. And so that was kind of I, like, it just wasn't really satisfying to me. And I knew that book seven never got completed like he had planned. So I just was like, I'm just going to stop. Like life's too short to waste time reading books <laughs> you don't like. So not that I didn't like it. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't a book I enjoyed. So I was like, I'm going to move on to something else. So if someone was to be like, I loved the Dune movies, would you recommend they read all six books or? Well, I would say if you, if you like the movies, you have to at least read the original Dune. I think that's like a must read. I think it's a huge page turner, was an instant classic, was just a worldwide phenomena, just rocketed Frank Herbert into stardom. Obviously all of his other books, people tend to fall off eventually somewhere as time goes on. But, uh, you know, Dune, Dune's an incredible book. I think it's a book, even if you didn't like the movies, I'd say read the book because yeah, it's just that good. True. It's interesting you said you like Dune Messiah the best because I have noticed even though it's that one didn't do as well. It also didn't do as well because what happens with Paul, people didn't like it. Right. And like I've talked about in my Dune Part 2 video, and like you just said, like readers were misinterpreting the story. And so Frank Herbert was like, no, 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 like I, I got to fix this. And so readers didn't like Dune Messiah because they're like, wait, what? <laughs> this isn't what we wanted. I think Dune, the first one is definitely my favorite because like you said, I was more invested in the characters right. and there's just, it was a page turner because there's so much going on. And then each of the characters, 
I felt like they were so well developed and there's various characters who die throughout the story in each of their death scenes like you feel it because we got to know these characters so well you know um and then yeah Dune Messiah I did enjoy that one as well and we will be getting into spoilers as far as the books go later on but Children of Dune that one felt like it had so much going on and there were a lot of characters and I did feel like I had a hard time always keeping track of like and there's all these people conspiring against oh, each other. Oh for sure. Yeah yeah. <laughs> Which you, you get that in all it's of like, them. Who are but, these people? Yeah. For sure. <laughs> but regardless I did really like Children of Dune and the way it ends with the character of Leto. I definitely want to read God Emperor of Dune so I'll definitely give that one a, a read but I've read the three books so far and I personally would recommend them. I did find them really interesting. They can be kind of dense at times. Like you said, he does get philosophical, which that is interesting. But yeah, so I guess as far as our spoiler free thoughts go, we would both recommend, especially the first book. Like he said, like, I'm not even a fan of fantasy books and like the world building. And even in Dune, the world building, I was just neutral on. Like sometimes I feel like it takes away from the characters and their story arc because that's what I'm really invested in are the characters. Right. Uh, but even so, I definitely love Dune. That was a five-star book for me, so I definitely recommend at least that one. Okay, so I guess we will just move into spoilers now. So we're now going to move on to our thoughts on the movies and how they compare with the books, and specifically getting Joe's thoughts, because I've already made two videos, like almost two hours worth of me to sharing my thoughts on the movies. So yeah. I'll just let you take the lead on this one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, obviously characters are huge. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the actors and their performances to kind of start off. And I personally think Timothy Chalamet was really miscast in this role, Ooh. which I I Hot don't take. know. Yeah. <laughs> but so, and this is kind of like my, my reason for it, right? So you look at Paul and the way he's introduced, especially in the first book, uh, this is an athletic guy. So he's training in the gym every day, four hours, and he's a fit guy. And you look at T Timothy Chalamet, and he's just this skinny little runt of a guy. And like the scenes where he's like doing action stuff, you're like, dude, like I wouldn't even be scared of you. And that was, like, so Dune 1, I was already like, I don't know, maybe he'll start working out. And by the time he gets to Dune 2, it's going to be okay. And then the fight scene that he has, I was like, there's no way he's going to win this fight. Like, I don't care if he can see the future. He's about to get pounded down. Like, Wait, are you talking about Fade Rotha? Yeah, the then? Fade Rotha is because, and I was talk talking to someone else about this. Like, Fade Rotha, they have the scene where he's, like, about to enter, enter the Coliseum, and you just see his back muscles, and you're like, this dude is ripped. Timothy Chalamet, it's like they intentionally didn't want you to see him with his shirt off. Even the, like, love scene that you get with him and Zendaya, like, it only shows, it's like a close-up on his face. Like, look at this guy, he's very attractive. And it's because, yeah, man, this guy's not a fighter. And so, I think he was really miscast. I thought he gave a good performance, but I do not think he is somebody that you're like, that was Paul Medib, that's the guy. Paul Arrakis, no one's going to do it better than him. And another scene that I think kind of shows that, uh, and I know you did a podcast on The Godfather, and you talk about this scene, but I think the best scene in the original Godfather, so it's in Las Vegas, and he's talking to Ed Mooney, and it's Al Pacino, right? And there's a, a shot where it's like you're across the table from Al Pacino as he's doing this, and you can just see in his eyes, and you're like, dude, I would not want to be negotiating with this guy this dude is crazy. I was waiting to get that for like Paul's character because this guy it, and the director talked about, he's like, this is not a hero. But like with Timothy, it's like he's not charismatic enough to be scary, like powerful, but he's also not. He wasn't threatening enough. He de right. He definitely wasn't threatening. And I will say like my my personal favorite part of Dune 2 is like when he's giving his speech and he's like rousing people and you're like, yeah, let's go kill somebody, you know? Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's a good scene. Like I said, I think it's a good performance. He's a good actor. Actor. I just think he was totally miscast. I don't think he was designed for this role. And I just think physically, he just doesn't have the ability to play an, like an athletic character. Like he should at least have the build of like a high school quarterback, you know, and just the way he walks, you can tell he's not an athletic person. And so that was my biggest complaint as far as the cast overall Wait, was just, I just him. Can I just Yeah, Timothy? go for it. Go for it. I will say in the first movie, so Timothy Chalamet, I don't know how old he is, but in 2021 with the first movie, Paul is only 15. Yeah, he's young. And For the sure. movies also don't do a time jump. So I guess he's 15, 16 this whole time. So I feel like that was one reason they did cast him, though, is because even though he's in his 20s, he could pass as a scrawny teenager. And so I feel like there is that where, like... I mean, he is like a, an intense fighter. So there is that part. But maybe he's just a teenager who didn't bulk up as quickly or something. His genetics hadn't quite kicked in to where he was like gaining all this muscle. He's got perhaps. those Bruce Lee lean <laughs> yeah. muscles. He's not jacked. 
Yeah. So I, I see where you're coming from, but that would be like one potential... Counter argument? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think there are people that are into that side of build, you know, that find him attractive. I personally, like, I just... Uh, like, I don't know. I just don't think he's an attractive looking guy. He just looks like, I don't know, a runty little dude that like you could break <laughs> two. Maybe uh, they also didn't want to focus on his physical appearance, you know, like with Fade Rotha, for example, where, yeah, obviously like Austin Butler put on like 70 pounds of muscle or I meant to say he gained 25 pounds of muscle. Something. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was like training intensely for that role. Yeah. And so maybe they wanted to have that to maybe show how much, how, you know, Fade Rotha is like this brute force, mm -hmm. whereas Paul, he doesn't rely just on the muscle because he has like so much other things yeah. going on. And so that he but doesn't need to be super muscular. Another thing, they also say how the Fremen are uh, like, because they have such little water in their system, they do say how they have this certain look to them. Like well, they call got. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause they're so mm -hmm. scarce of water. So there, you could argue that as well, but. I could see that piece, but so here's what I'm saying. Like you look at like Michael Jordan in like the 1990s when he's in prom, the way he walks, the dude's not jacked. He's a skinny guy. Bruce Lee, similar, not a big dude. The way he walks, you can tell this is an athletic person who is like very comfortable with their body that uses their body on a regular basis. You look at like Timothy and just his performance and just how he acts in his body. You're like, this isn't it. And there's multiple one-on-one -on -one fight scenes. There's him in combat. And it's just like, this dude is the guy. I don't know. For me, I wouldn't want to go into combat with Timothy Chalamet and I don't think he would last very long. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so that's my opinion on, on his character, but it sounds like you were a little bit more pro uh, in terms of his performance. Yeah, I, I actually hadn't thought of him, like his body build, that didn't really come into play. But you did make a good point, you know, like with the look in his eyes and Al Pacino, that's a good comparison I forget his character's name in The Godfather, but Al Pacino, his character arc is kind of similar to oh, Paul. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so yeah. that's a very relatable uh, character comparison. And yeah, Al Pacino does a great job. Having yeah. said that, I was on board with Timothy Chalamet. I thought he did a good performance. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets an Oscar nomination. Oh, wow. So overall, I don't have complaints. And these things you're bringing up, I hadn't considered. But, you know, I, I can see where you're coming from. Uh, so the other character I want to talk about is Zendaya. So personally, I was really excited about her casting. Um, I think she's really, really good in uh, Euphoria, which if you haven't seen that, I mean, she just really embodies that character. Like she's very, very believable. I thought she did really well as MJ in Spider-Man. And so I was kind of curious to see her kind of develop into a little bit more advanced character. Like she's a teenager in both of those movies. That's kind of who she plays. And so I was hoping for kind of a more mature performance. And I don't know if they just wanted her to keep leaning into that kind of character. She's just kind of been typecast into that now. But I don't really think that she provided the level of performance I was hoping from her. Now, I will also say, uh, and we've already kind of talked about Frank Herbert and character development. Shawnee needed to change, right? If you've read the books, and you watch the movie, like if I was the actress, I'd be like, there's no way I'm playing this girl. She has no spine. She basically is just like the doting lover that just follows her little man around and supports him and is like, don't worry, I'll be your side girl. I don't mind. And it's just, it's just weird. Like, oh, and it feels really fake. It would feel really fake in the movie, I feel like, because the girl is hot. Like, what's her name? The Irulan. blonde. Yeah, the blonde, the actress. Florence Pugh. Uh, Florence Pugh. I think she gave the best performance I've seen for her. I'm not a huge Florence Pugh f uh, fan. I think she just done a pretty good job in her movies, but but like, this is a movie where I was like, wow, she like, she's killed it. She's got charisma. She's like a character that has a really small role, but it's like an outsized impact. And like every scene with her, she's just like, you're a, like, at least for me, like I was really focused in on her, even though she's surrounded by all these other like really talented actors. And so like, yeah, when he's like, yeah, I'm going to marry you. Yeah, there needed to be something. It just, it didn't feel very realistic in the book. Uh, and especially seeing, I think in the flesh in the movie it wouldn't, wouldn't have turned out. So, and especially the book is 1965 and here in 2024, if they're like, oh, and she's going to be his concubine, but she's okay with that. I feel like audiences would be like, what? <laughs> You're like, that doesn't work, but feminism. Although, yeah. But also with that, uh, like there's certain things with this book series as things go on. Like we have kids trying to kill their parents, you know, with Aaliyah yeah. in a later book and, uh, you know, in the third book, which we're going to be getting into some spoilers for the third books, but, or for the later books. But there's also two siblings who get married because they're like, hey, we got to maintain our role on the throne. And so I do think these royal families, they're also just not thinking the way normal humans do because the positions they're in. And so like Chani, in some ways you can't, you can see why she's just like, hey, he's going to be the emperor and this is a political marriage. And so I feel like there is like 
a different mindset that you have to have when you're in a situation where you're with someone who's going to be an emperor. Like you can't have the normal complaints that you would have in a regular relationship. So in some ways in the books, it does kind of make sense that she knows what she's gotten herself into and right. she's upset, but she's just like, like, okay. Yeah. It, and so I think my biggest complaint with Shani's character in the movie is like, and I, I see this sometimes like in, in my kind of like my professional life as people get promoted up, like there's people who knew you back before you got promoted and they'll be like, oh, so-and-so, they're not so great. I remember back when they were just one of us and now they're a manager and they think they can baby all. And I kind of felt like that's what Shawnee's character was like. And I was like, dude, this is your like boyfriend. Like show some support. Like, I don't know for me, if, if I was the dude and that's how my girlfriend was acting, I'd be like, listen, this relationship's over. Clearly you don't support me. You're not on the same page and that's fine. But like, I don't, I don't need my girlfriend to be like the one who's making a public spectacle and like trying to bring me down in public. You're not helping our, like me at all right now. I was listening to another podcast. There was a video and they were saying how the fact that this relationship in the book, she's been with Paul for over two years by the Mm -hmm. time this happens. Whereas in the movie, yeah, yeah, they had a child together. Whereas Mm -hmm. in the movie, it's been less than nine months. Right. And so in the book, she's like, you know what? Like, I've been with this guy for a couple of years now and she's more um, on board and she knows what she's gotten herself into. Whereas Chani in the movie, you know, it's been a few months and Paul starts to change and she's just like, whoa, like this is too early in the relationship for me to feel like I have to stick by this guy. Yeah. And so I feel like that change, the time, condensing the time kind of made sense for Chani to feel that way. Whereas in the book, if she was that way, it would be like, you've been with him for two years now. Like, you know what you got and yourself now into. now you're <laughs> figuring this out whereas in the movie yeah the relationship is still young enough that she's like wait a minute like do i want to be on board with this maybe a mass murderer is not the guy i want to be with (laughs) i will say real quick i really like the movie visually amazing and this is kind of something you've talked about it's very faithful to the book which i think is is really good and the changes they make honestly i can see why they would have wanted to make changes um but i think one thing they kind of missed is i feel like the fremens are just like this power keg that or this powder keg that's just waiting to explode paul is going to be the match that lights it one way or the other and i know he doesn't go to the south which is kind of where they talk about the religious fanatics and that where th- that's where they are but like you don't really get a sense of, like if paul died i never got a sense of, like oh man the fremen they're just gonna unleash it if Paul dies. That's kind of where the book is leading. They're like, listen, this jihad's unavoidable. Either Paul's going to be a martyr and they're going to like murder in his name and just cause reckless abandon and just do all this stuff. Or he's going to be at the head and he's going to be leading the charge. And so I think that's one thing they, they missed. Like they had a couple scenes where there was like humor, like, oh, you know, that's what a prophet would say. Ha ha ha. And there's a couple times where like the people in the theater would be like laughing and stuff. And I was like, okay, I mean, it's kind of comedic but like also these people i don't know it just didn't feel like oh yeah like they're they're ready to like and like break the yokes off yeah that's an interesting point there is a part where irulan she's talking to the emperor and she tells Mm -hmm. him being like well you can't kill him that'll just motivate them even more and he'll become more powerful if he becomes a martyr so they do touch on it there right uh but yeah that's an interesting complaint too yeah i'd have to think about that one on whether or not i totally agree with you but yeah, that's an interesting point. I will say one of the things that I, I really love about the book and Frank Herbert and how he kind of wrote it, and I think the movie does a pretty good job depicting it, is it's kind of hard to imagine what this sort of superpower would feel like, like the ability to see the future. You're like, okay, like, are you like omniscient? Like you just know exactly what's going to happen. Like, uh, I think, I don't know if it's like a matrix where it's like, she's talking about like, oh, you know, did I chip over the cookies because you told me I was going to, or like, did so they have a couple different ways that they would kind of try to help explain the superpower and one of them is like hey it's like looking out and you're like you have this ocean and there's certain like waves that are like higher up and you can kind of visualize like those peaks but then underneath like into the valleys or kind of the the lower beneath that is hidden and you don't know and then there's also like certain nexus points where there's just so many possibilities and like the smallest deviation can change things i think it's like lord of the rings there it's like walking along the edge of a knife so it's kind of that similar um depiction and kind of gives you an appreciation of like wow paul's power is like insane but there are limitations to it and he's not like totally invincible. The other thing I really liked and we kind of talked about a little bit already with this jihad is sometimes you're like, oh man, this dude's a super human messiah, whatever. He can just do whatever he wants. He can manipulate people around him. But 
he's like, listen, I mean, this jihad is going to happen. And I think we've all had that in life. We're like, oh man, I want to achieve this. And you're like, okay, I'm going to do these things and I'm going to line it up. And it's just like everything around you just seems to be working against you or maybe your own body, like maybe limits you or whatever the case may be. You're just like, man, it's just not meant to be. And I think this book did a good job of, of kind of showing like, hey, no one is so powerful that they can overcome every and all limitating factors that are being pushed against them. And society does have an incredible weight that sometimes is more than just one person can change. Yeah. But yeah, when you were talking about, you know, like these visions he's getting, there's a part in the book where it's after the time jump and he has not drank the water of life, but the spice itself is just giving him tons of visions. Mm -hmm. And there's a part where he is kind of, it's showing like how he, he's not going crazy, but he's like, wait, did I do that? Or did I see that in a vision? Was that a vision from the past? Was that from the future? And how he's having a hard time keeping track of what's real and what's not. Yeah. And the movie, I talk about this in my Dune Part 2 video, but they did not show the power of the spice as much yeah, in the second agree. book, in the second movie. Paul is not getting as many visions at all. Right. And then just in general, like the spice is the whole reason why people care about Arrakis, right? And so yeah. I feel like they could have built it up a bit more in the second movie because uh, otherwise... I'm sure most people who see the second movie have seen the first, but imagine right. someone going into this movie cold, they would be like, the spice is hardly mentioned. Like, <laughs> so, what's that? What's the big deal? Yeah. And I did get people commenting, saying a complaint they had was the fact that we don't see the spacing guild and the yeah. guild navigators aren't even in the first book. They don't come in until the second. Right. But yeah, we don't see how it affects the spacing guild and the politics going on in the book, which I think personally, I think it was a good call to simplify the story. But right. we also in the book, like the Fremen are paying the Spacing Guild in Spice in order to keep satellites out of the South so that they can keep their secrecy. And so oh, there's yeah. just so much more going on. And the Spacing Guild, uh, the Guild Navigators, they use the Spice to travel, but they also like live in these tanks full of Spice. Yeah, well, I did like how they depicted that. I think in the, the first movie, there's a scene where it like, it looks like they're sort of, it's almost like they have a fish bowl as a oh, head, yeah. which made them look a lot better. Like the Dune 1984, like the, they introduce all these weird characters <laughs> right away. And they're just like, what am I watching right now? Yeah. And so I think Frank Herbert was right, like to sort of be like, you listen, now there's some weird characters. We'll get to them later. You mean Danny Villeneuve was right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Frank Herbert too. I mean, he he also, if you read the books, oh. a lot of these characters you don't really get into, like you talked about until later, like the Gola, like uh, which yeah. I'm I'm curious to see if even that even happens because even oh, yeah. even the directors talked about like, listen, there's some stuff that happens that's really weird that I really do Messiah is the last one I want to do because it's just yeah. really hard to stay faithful to him after that. Uh, and I'm, I still think like with Shawnee's character, there's going to be some stuff where he's got to kind of break with uh, the faithful retelling. Yeah. So I did want to get into what happens in the later books and what we predict will happen Ooh, in the future yeah. movie. So we can, was there any thoughts though? Like I know we wanted to get into Paul and also the terraforming of Arrakis. That was a huge part of the first book. And oh, Leah sure. Kynes, like that was his mission was to help the Fremen transform Arrakis so that it wouldn't be such a like harsh climate for the Fremen. Mm-hmm. And it's a reoccurring theme throughout all the books. Yeah, I there was another YouTube video and someone commented being like, Paul is the main character of Dune and Dune Messiah, but the planet Dune is the main character of the rest of the books. And oh, that's sure. the whole point. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the movie does not get into that. We see how Stilgar shows her all the water the Fremen have being like, you know, even if we were dying, we would not drink this because we're saving this in order, in order to turn Dune into a paradise. Mm-hmm. And that's all we see about it. But yeah, in the books, this was a much bigger deal and it becomes a bigger deal as time goes on. Right. But, but yeah, so before we move on to the later stories. Did we want to talk about Paul a bit more? Well, and I wanted to say in my video, I do say that he becomes a villain and I kind of backtracked being like, oh, but it's, you know, he's more nuanced than that. And yeah, I feel like even calling him a hero or a villain, neither title fits because he does have good intentions because he wants to help the Fremen achieve their dreams. And he also wants to get revenge on the Harkonnens for killing his father and everything. But he has good intentions Mm -hmm. as he's leading the Fremen. Ultimately, you know, it then leads to a holy war though. And in the books, like billions have died. And yeah. then he becomes, I mean, in the second book, I don't think he himself ever really becomes like a tyrannical leader. And in Dune Messiah, he doesn't like what he has caused to happen. And so calling him a hero or a villain, I don't think either title really fits because it's so much more complex than that. Uh, and Frank Herbert, there was a quote where he said, the difference between the story of a hero and the story of an antihero is where you end the story. <laughs> And there was also another quote where 
um, saying something about how Dune is the story of how horrible it can be when the good guy wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also going along with that, at the end of Dune Part 2, I didn't mention this, but in the movie, Jessica has like her telepathy with the Reverend Mother and she's saying to the Reverend Mother, like, you chose the wrong side, like now you see. Yeah. And the Reverend Mother is like, you should know better than that. There are no sides. The Harkonnens are clearly horrible people and Fade Rotha, I think they right. built him up to be so much more sadistic in the movie. Right, right. So they were like the lesser of two evils, of course. But even so, <laughs> Paul's leadership ends to this like decade plus long war. Mm -hmm. And he's sending the Fremen off to die. And so just how Paul is leading them to die and give their water away to other planets and just like the impacts, yeah. the impact of that on the Fremen people, even though they get what they want. But sorry, I know I'm talking a lot. But also the other books, like Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, it was interesting to see that the Fremen getting what they want, like the impact it has on their culture throughout the rest of the books yeah, was really sure. interesting. And maybe getting what they wanted wasn't <laughs> the best thing. I Obviously being, you know, suppressed and killed by the Harkonnens wasn't good. But anyway, just I really admire just how complex everything is. And it's not a black and white story. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I think it's a really relevant, uh, you know, topic today. I mean, you look at the rise of artificial intelligence, you know, computing was just kind of getting into its own in the 1960s. And, and people were kind of imagining what that capability would bring. And obviously, in the decades that have come, we're getting closer and closer to computers having a even greater impact in our daily lives in like our work. And so, you know, it is curious to imagine what that's going to look like for decision making at, you know, the strategic level at national levels. And, you know, is that going to be for good? Or is it going to be for bad? Because, you know, humans don't always make rational decisions. Uh, so, you know, we are emotional creatures. Is it good to have something that is totally analytical making determinations? And is that ultimately going to be for the good of humanity? Uh, you know, obviously, yeah, you'll see. And talking about making analytical decisions, another thing with Dune 2 is that in the books, Paul is a Mentat too, because he's been Mentat trained. And Mentats mm -hmm. are like human computers. Right. And the second movie, we have no Mentats whatsoever. Yeah. And in the book, like, Thufir Hawit is taken in by the Harkonnens, but there's a part where the Baron, someone is questioning him, being like, what, like, you have Hawit now? And he's like, I needed a Mentat. Like, I can't survive without a Mentat. And it made me think of, like, our computers, right? If someone took away a computer, we'd be like, what? Like, I have to have a computer. I have to have a cell phone. <laughs> and you that's can't what, take that from me. Yeah, and that's what Mentats are. Um, but also, I noticed it more in Children of Dune. Maybe I missed it in the other books. But they get more into, like, the Voltarian Jihad, I think is what it's called. Which is when they got yeah. rid of all of the machines and computers. Right. And so I thought those segments were really interesting. Because we live in an age where AI and computers were so dependent on them. Mm -hmm. But Dune lives in an age past that where they've realized, like, we can't depend on computers like we need the computer analytical aspect but we'll get that out of our humans and make them our computers but Denny Villeneuve obviously couldn't include everything because right. there is so much but yeah the Mentats I thought were really interesting but we don't get them at all in the second no. movie and Paul is not a Mentat in the movies right right yeah for sure and so kind of looking forward right like what is the future of uh you know Dune the cinema and oh, we will ahead. have from here on out we will be getting into spoilers into the following books in the series because as we predict what will happen it'll be based on what we know happens in the books so if you do not want the following books spoiled don't watch this part yeah so I, at the time of this recording I, supposedly the director has not written any script i mean i'm sure he has some ideas in his head but supposedly nothing's been kind of put to paper yet and so what i'm kind of hoping happens i'm just going to talk like what i hope happens i'm not going to talk like this is what i think is going to happen so based off how dune 2 ended in my like perfect you know what i'd kind of like to see i know they kind of foreshadowed like oh yeah shawnee's going to come back to paul and he kind of talks about like i've seen a division she comes back to me i would love to see shawnee just become like the arch nemesis and like in part and i I will also say, I kind of hope they do part three and four. And he, he ends up starting to write and is just like, I can't do this in one movie. I need to do it in two. Because there's so many trilogies already. You've got The Matrix. I know they did a fourth one, but that doesn't count. And then you have, you know, obviously Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. You have Star Wars. Uh, and Lord of the Rings less so, but The Matrix and Star Wars for sure, very similar, right? You've got the Messiah trope. You've got very similar. Like The Matrix, I think of like Stilgar. And he basically is, uh, you know, Morpheus. Like I feel like oh. they just basically, and that's why I think The Matrix actually might be a better movie is because they've taken a lot of characters and they've combined them to simplify the story but anyway sidetrack on that real quick but so i hope shawnee becomes like his arch nemesis and she's like i'm gonna bring down paul he's evil and this is not gonna stand and she creates like a little rebel group and i don't know how they would take it there because i think it's pretty hard uh they obviously won't have kids i guess yeah if, which 
I mean, that would be big. That'd be a big change. Part of me wonders if Chani does not return to Paul. Like, I could see it going either way to some extent. But part of me is like, would Irulan be the mother of the twins then? Oh, wow. Uh, and the twins, like, they that awake in the womb. That would be pretty cool, womb. actually. Yeah, but then the reason the twins awake in the womb is because Chani is on so much spice. So that means Irulan needs to be hooked to the spice as well. Which wouldn't be hard if she's on the island. Yeah, uh, yeah. The planet. It would naturally happen, I feel like. But, but yeah, so that's what I was wondering. If oh. they Oh, wow. keep Chani as like the enemy. Ooh. Then. So you thought that might happen too then? I mean, I, they could find a way to make her come back. And I also meant to bring up the theory that at the end of the movie, when Chani leaves Paul, she already is pregnant. So either she'll have the twins out in the desert on her own, or maybe her pregnancy will, that's what will get her back to Paul. So that is another theory I heard someone else say that it could potentially be what happens. But I also wonder if the next movie will do a time jump or do you think we'll see the war happen? Well, I think there has to be a time jump because yeah, and I yeah. feel like they built the gap in there already. They're like, hey, we're yeah. going to take a couple of years off. Like script hasn't even been written. Like it could be at least five, maybe even 10 years before part three comes out. Just how oh. long it takes for it all to happen, you know, production yeah, and everything. True. It could be wrong. I'm sure there's going to be a rush because it made a lot of money uh, or is making a lot of money now. Uh, and I would like to see a movie sooner rather than later. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like there's some elements there. I mean, obviously the, the sister is going to have to get incorporated they've already foreshadowed her oh yeah uh so i'd like her to just be like this wild card crazy lady where she's just doing like crazy stuff and paul's like i gotta manage this girl she's just doing <laughs> and she's well, sort of distracting him from uh you know shawnee's plan or something yeah and to talk about dune messiah so in the book, yeah, Chani is his concubine and he stays loyal to Chani. And in the book, Irulan, it's funny because in Dune 1, every chapter begins with Irulan's histories. And so in Dune Messiah, they're like, oh, Irulan, all she has is her documents and her histories. And that's like <laughs> what she spends her time doing because everybody hates her and Paul gives her no attention. Yeah. So he does stay true to his word. But then Irulan, she is like giving Chani some kind of poison to prevent right. Chani from being pregnant. And so that's a stress for Chani in the second movie and it's because Irulan is like conspiring with the Reverend Mother and a guild right. navigator. But yeah, if Chani's not in the picture, then maybe Irulan, her character will change a lot if that's the case. Yeah. So I'm curious to see what happens. And I'm not opposed to a change to Irulan because she's kind of a nothing character in a lot of ways. So yeah. I would love to see a bit more going on with her, especially being played by Florence Pugh, who, yeah, I think she's an amazing actor. So I'm excited to see her more in the third one. Yeah. And I, I do think that's like one of the limitations, uh, like a as someone who's done a little bit of writing my own, it's very hard to like write from a female perspective for me. And I, I feel like a lot of like, people have that same issue because there are very subtle differences. I know there's like, you know, gender fluidity discussions, but at the end of the day, like there are biological differences. We have different chemicals running through us. So, and so I, I think a lot of that's Frank Herbert too. All of his female characters are just like a little weird, I feel like, mm -hmm. and they're just not written as well. A lot of it too, it's like the, the main characters tend to get a lot of the attention, but as the, and I would say this throughout, like he's I, like, I read up to about halfway through the sixth book and I can't think of one of the female characters that he wrote that I was like, okay, this is really believable except for maybe lady jessica and i feel like lady yeah. jessica leans in really hard to like her motherly tendencies which is kind of an easier thing to write about as like a, a person like a guy or anybody right it's easy to understand what would motivate a mother and to be mm. able to depict that and all the other characters though shawnee definitely and you know as you move through the other books you're like man this female character just feels sort of like Bleh. yeah and i was i loved Aaliyah in the first book as like this two-year-old who is like an adult mm -hmm. and she kills the bear and and everything. Oh yeah, that was badass. Yeah. <laughs> but I was kind of disappointed like in Dune Messiah I, I mean, she becomes um, like a goddess in a way and she's yeah. worshipped and she'll mm -hmm. like go out and meet the pilgrims. And yeah. so she does have a role to play in everything. But also there's also like weird sexual stuff with her too, where it's oh, like, sure. oh, she has these like sexual frustrations going on. And there's a part where she's like training with some machine or something oh, and yeah. she's naked and oh, they walk yeah. in and see her. And, and Paul it's walks like, oh. in and is like, uh, <laughs> yeah. hello, sister. Yeah. And then in the second movie, we bring back Duncan Idaho. So I forget, is it the Spacing Guild or, or no, the Theolax? Or? Yeah, yeah. But the, he's like one of the Golas. Like he's such a big character casting. I feel like they're going to bring him back, right? Like Momoa, yeah. he's got to come I, back. I would like to see him come back because I did think that was kind of like a weird but cool part of the story of that he's brought back from the dead in a way yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, and you're then, like, it's the future. Anything's possible. Yeah. And then like they he and Aaliyah have this romance. And it was, if, yeah. I'm, if I recall, 
recall correctly, there was like that cliche moment where like she's like upset and fired up. And so then he kisses her and she's like, <gasps> like, why did you kiss me? And he's like, because you you wanted it or you needed to be kissed or one of yeah, those yeah, kind yeah. of Yeah, yeah, yeah. The romantic <laughs> scenes get progressively weirder as like the books move in. Like you're like, okay. Yeah. And to jump ahead to Children of Dune, also, you know, Aaliyah, it worked where she's a two-year-old acting like an adult. Like, mm -hmm. I thought that was cool. I liked it. But Children of Dune, I feel like there were multiple scenes that were just weird because Leto and um, Ganema, is that who, how you say her last name? Uh, oh, the sister. Leto's sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Ganema. They are mm -hmm. nine years old. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they have, you know, they're like Aaliyah where, like, they are adults and so yeah. wise and everything. Right. And there's, like, sexual things with each of them at different points where Leto Leto has like a, a vision of him having sex with another woman. And it's like, this kid is nine years old. This is weird. And yeah. then Gana Ganima, like talking to this guy being like, oh, like we're going to be the ones married. And she's like touching his arm saying, you know, something. And the guy's like, okay, like you're only nine. And she's like, don't make that mistake again. Because they don't like being referred to as children because their brains are so old. And yeah. it's like, that, that's... That's still, very uncomfortable. That's still weird. It's very I, awkward. I, so I don't know. I feel like Herbert didn't do a great job with certain aspects with that. It was just kind of odd. Yeah. Well, there's definitely some some like weird themes for sure. So like the the sexual stuff gets a little odd, and then even just like they never talk about eugenics, but like the whole like birthing program for the Bene Gesserit, oh, yeah. and then there's a lot of these references where we have to maintain the bloodline, and so it just I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of surprised it got published in the 1960s because eugenics in the 1960s was I feel like not a very like it was very like associated with like Nazis and so there was sort of this like no let's not do that but they they talk about with the Bene Gesserit I mean they're intentionally trying to have kids with these certain people kind of what you were talking about right like it's a 1960s book there's certain like themes it's definitely a very patriarchal society still that's being depicted in Iraqis and Dune and um you know Duke Leto the Baron the Emperor they're all like male characters yeah yeah but then they all do like there's like the imperial reverend mother and the Fremen have a mm -hmm. reverend mother. So at least their religious figure is a female in all of these different cultures. But it is a very patriarchal society. Yeah, so the movie made some changes with that. Or the doctor is a female, whereas the male in the Oh yeah, uh, Leah Kynes was a man mm -hmm. in the book. So I personally do enjoy when they kind of, when they're adapting an older work where so many characters are male. I like when directors make the change to be like, okay, we got to make some of these people women because this author just wrote a bunch of men in this story. So yeah, so I'm usually always on board with stuff like that. But also for people curious to know like the basic gist of what happens in the following books, I was thinking we could kind of get into that a bit to let people, if people want to know what happens, but they don't want to read the books, well, maybe that should be a separate video. Well, I think one of the overarching um, themes, and I think it's going to be interesting to see if it comes up in the in the next uh, movie, is this idea of like the golden path. And you don't yeah. really see that with Paul, it's more with his son, but it, you do see him referencing is like, hey, you know, my son's going to come and he's going to ultimately, you know, lead, lead the path. And basically, it's this idea of like, hey, if Paul never existed, if if uh, Leto never came in and was, you know, the tyrant emperor, all of humanity would have been wiped out, which is kind of hard to believe because you're like, you're spread out across all these planets. You think somebody on one of these planets would figure out a way to survive, but whatever, you know, <laughs> sure, they figured out like a Death Star that could just, you know, kill everybody, I guess. Seemed a little far-fetched, but that was basically the concept that like, hey, these, this is going to save everyone. And so that's ultimately kind of the, the conclusion it's going to reach in book four that you get to. And the character art for Paul, I thought was was really interesting and one of the the reasons why again i think timothy chalamet was just not a great pick for this role is he's just he has this indomitable will and you just get the sense of it more and more as you progress through this book and even as you get into the later um series even when he's not really a main character like there's a scene where like leto his son like brings paul back and is like having this discussion with paul and paul is eventually is like walks away and leaves which is crazy if you've read the other books up to that point because you have the baron you have all these other people that are dead that are just like they have this second chance at life and they just grip at it and they're like give me a chance to live again and Paul is just has such a strong sense of will he's able to just literally turn around and say I don't want a second chance I'm good with it I'm leaving you also feel that in the end of the second book where he's like hey I'm gonna ultimately get attacked I'm not gonna die but I'm gonna lose my sight and I'm just gonna disappear and walk away from everything and basically just become like this prophet character as you find out in book three again tons of spoilers there so hopefully you know if you're planning to read it you're like you know not surprised 
surprised now. But I, I thought that was really interesting, really well written, and it has like a really good character arc. And that's one of the reasons why Paul is such a compelling character to read about all the way through the first three books. And I think Leto takes that on in, in book four, and he's still an interesting character. I think he's the only character that's really well developed in book four. And you kind of he kind of becomes this pathetic figure where he's like becoming this worm and he can't produce or have offspring. I also think there's like subtle references where it's like he's basically losing his identity to this worm. And uh, which, yeah, we didn't get into that. But in yeah. Children of Dune, Leto is Paul's nine year old son. So they have a baby in Dune. They name him Leto. He dies. They have another baby and they're like, let's just call him Leto again. The first didn't, didn't the first work the first work time. Out. We're going for it again. So I was like, that seems messed up to reuse the same name. Do but they only have two names in this family? Paul yeah. and Leto? They don't yeah. have any other ones? Come on. Uh, but yeah, so Leto, he fuses with sandworm larva. He has it so like weird. Such crawl a weird up over theme. him. Yeah. And by the end of Children of Dune, like he is, he's not, I think he still looks human, but he has this yeah. weird skin and right. he can like run and jump across the dunes. Right. But yeah, it, it implies that over time he's going to become more and more worm-like. And by book four, I haven't read that one but i did read that we time jump like thousands of years right and so yeah. at this point think- and in children of dune he says like i'm gonna be able to live for four thousand years <laughs> and so i will be be able to oversee arrakis and everything the yeah. you know the entire universe essentially but yeah so that was pretty wild <laughs> and the third book has like so many crazy things happening where right from the start you know you have the twins who yeah. are really unique characters jessica returns she wasn't in the second book because she was busy on caladan just relaxing and (laughs) hooking up with Gurney Halleck. (laughs) And then we have this preacher show up. He right from the start was interesting and people in the town and the Fremen speculate like, whoa, like what if that's Paul? And so that got me hooked being like, whoa, like is he Paul? Who is this guy? Is he bad? And then you have Aaliyah who like you said, people who die, you know, so the characters like Aaliyah and the twins and Paul because they have access to just everything. Dead people can easily possess them if they allow Mm -hmm. it. And so Aaliyah becomes possessed by the Baron Harkonnen, which again, that was something where I was like, whoa, like this book is crazy. Yeah, (laughs) I liked Aaliyah and her possession with the Baron. I did think that was really interesting. But as the story went on, I feel like, like in the final scene with her, we get kind of the classic possession scene where it says how she's speaking in different voices and we get it was almost like too much of the classic possession scene and I was just not loving that and there's a part where Leto he picks her up by her foot and he says it says he spins her across his head which was just so ridiculous and I didn't like that um and they basically tell her like they have a window open and they're like you can either jump out of this window or like we kill you I guess like either kill yourself yeah it seems like there was maybe another option but so then she just dies in the end and so in general, like Aaliyah in the second book, I was kind of disappointed where things went with her to some extent. In the third book, I was intrigued at the start, but the way way things ended. But to go along with that, Jessica, you know, she, Aaliyah was her daughter, right? So she was really mm-hmm. upset to see what happens with Aaliyah. But in the book, she's thinking how in some ways, like Aaliyah never stood a chance because she was the first ever to be like her, to be someone who was awoken in the womb. And so... Well, that's not totally true. I mean, they talk about the Bene Gesserit. Uh, I think they even use the word in the movie at once they're like abomination so the Bene Gesserit had tried to do this before and it never worked out and so that's why they're like listen if you're pregnant you do not become a reverend mother you're gonna get this crazy power your kid's gonna become possessed and they're not gonna be able to have it like it's just not a good idea yeah, but, yeah Leah was just given too much power and she didn't know how to handle it I yeah guess. yeah well just too young yeah she didn't have a sense of self yeah. that she'd been able to sort of create yet. Uh, which, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like if you were born with this bizarre access to other people. Yeah. And somehow Leto and, I, ke- I feel like I keep saying her name wrong, but Leto's sister, G- Ganima, they are, maybe also because they have each other for support. And so we do see how close they are. And they're the only two that can relate with each other. And so maybe that's why they had went a more successful route to some extent. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I will say, so one complaint I do have about the books. So I'm a big fan. I know there's been a lot of critiques this video. So you'd be like, man, this guy, I hate the dude. Like, why is he even on this? But I really enjoyed it. I like. I read six of them. I really liked them. 
But uh, you can kind of tell that it wasn't totally fleshed out, right? So he wrote Dune and like it got picked up by like, this random publisher. There wasn't necessarily an expectation that there was going to be more written. Obviously, there was a goal to do that. But like, he had a rough outline at most. And so I think there's some sort of there's some things that get referenced in like each of the books that you're kind of like waiting. And, I, and it's I don't think it's necessarily him subverting expectations. I think it just was like it, that string didn't necessarily go anywhere. So he's like, I'm just going to let that kind of like pretend that string's not there. and I'm going to go somewhere else. Like there's a like with Paul he has this vision with like two moons where they're like like falling almost yeah and that like never comes up again i mean maybe i missed something but it's like i kept waiting for it's like okay what's this vision with these moons maybe also like his visions because he sees all potential future so maybe yeah yeah potential future right 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 um and yeah just to kind of again for those curious just to wrap up with some of the events that happen so they bring duncan idaho from the dead he becomes Aaliyah's consort which is like the male version of a concubine and then in the third book Aaliyah, she's possessed by the baron so she's like turning against a lot of people and she once Duncan Idaho dead. But long story short, Stilgar ends up killing Duncan Idaho in the third book, which was kind of surprising. Yeah, are there any other like major events from the books that you feel like should be mentioned for people that are curious? I don't know. I think I think it's good. And I guess, yeah, I haven't read the fourth book yet, but I definitely plan to. So I personally don't want too much spoiled from that one. Oops. Uh, I mean, I already know the basic gist, but again, that's another story where Leto go- gets into power, but again, like he's going to have so much, pa- so much power, right? And he's going to be inhuman and not even superhuman just like this weird inhuman thing that can live for so long and so anyone having too much power is never a good thing right and that's kind of the point of dune and so we you know leto goes down a bad path and he becomes like a tyrannical leader as well yeah well i think one of the things that that i took away from the book like a a book is really good if like you you can kind of get some introspective like view on yourself you know like Mm -hmm. wow i didn't even know that about myself and so i remember as i was like reading dune i was like rooting for paul the whole way i mean even by book three i'm still rooting for paul i'm like paul's the best (laughs) and Oh, by the way, Paul ends up being killed. In, right. Oh, yeah. In I mean, Children of Dune, because right. he is the preacher. But anyway. Yeah. But like growing up, I was always like a big fan of like the, you know, the story of a hero rising to power. And I think part of it's like as a kid, you're like, oh, I can imagine myself. I'm going to be a superhero one day. I'm going to be whatever. And so reading this, obviously, like there's no expectation of that myself. You know, I'm already in my 30s. I've already lived out my prime. (laughs) But I'm still really compelled by this story. I'm just like, yeah, I'm really rooting for Paul. I was just like, man, this is crazy. that Like this trope is just so easy to manipulate. And like I am just fascinated by the rise of this character. Yeah. Obviously, he, he tries to turn it a little bit but even even the author's attempts to turn it fail because i'm still rooting for paul even through it all so yeah i think it's it's one of the reasons that it is such a timeless classic is it's telling you the messiah trope but it is telling you in a way that kind of helps you appreciate like man this is a fictional account of a guy who's probably not necessarily the best example of humanity or maybe he is and that's not the best you know reflection on on what we are capable of maybe uh power corrupts as they say but it's definitely a you know, something that kind of helps you appreciate maybe some of your own limitations as a person and how we just love to like put people on this pedestal yeah. and not, not just in the Messiah type of way. Imagine like political, right? We put these political figures on a pedestal. We do it religiously. We put these religious people on these pedestals and you're like, man, like, is this just like this? I'm hardwired just to want to follow this alpha wolf dog person and be like, yeah, you're the pack leader. I'm going to follow you. And obviously it's been hugely successful, right? I mean, that's part of why humans have succeeded and been able to achieve everything we've achieved is that we're willing to say oh yeah we'll die for you we'll build monuments for you we'll do all these things for you even though ultimately you're just you know blood and flesh like me yeah. you're still going to be put on this we're you know, willing to trust them with our lives oh, and for with sure. the lives of our country and yeah, our, you know absolutely. all these all these things yeah i had multiple thoughts one of them doesn't quite relate to that but um i remembered what i was going to say earlier because you were saying how frank herbert he gives like a lot of threads yeah and some he returns to and some he doesn't and there are characters in Dune or even like later books where it seems like oh like they'll come into play later and then like we the just Count? never hear about them. Count Fenring. I was going to bring him up. Yeah. You're He's like... such an interesting person and Margot Fenring and she has a baby with Fade Rotha. Like what's that child doing now? She's got to be having she she must be an interesting character. She could have been. Uh, and so yeah there's different things where it's like wait what? Like did he just forget that he wrote this really <laughs> compelling character and dropped it for someone else? <laughs> yeah. And again kind of just reiterating what we've been saying 
saying, yeah, these books, I really liked them, especially, you know, the character of Paul. He's the most well-written character in all of the books. And it's because he is just so complex. And so I love that where he's not a bad person, but he's also not necessarily a good person either. And he's by the end of the movie. And that's why in the end of the movie, we have the line where she says like, it's the start of the holy war. And the end of the book, it's kind of implied, but I can see why people read the book thinking Paul was a hero. Oh, for sure. <laughs> because it's not as blatantly expressed that this is going to lead to a jihad. And, you know, right. so well, they the made it... The Baron is so evil in comparison. Yeah. And, and we do get that in the movies too, where like Fade Rotha, I feel like they focus so much more on Fade Rotha than the Baron in the second movie. For sure. Because we don't hardly even see the Baron. Right. But yeah, so the Harkonnens are just so bad right. that of course you're rooting for Paul. But yeah. like I said, I just keep coming back to that quote about how Dune is the story of how horrible it can be when the good guy wins. But yeah, how as humans, we do want leaders and we need leaders, right? Like you have to have a boss and, but it's when they're given too much power is when it's the issue, right? Anyway, yeah, definitely is a book that gives you a lot to think about. Definitely. So yeah, I guess that wraps it up for our Dune discussion. I know it was kind of a bit all over the place, but I hope you guys enjoyed this. Definitely a different format than what I usually do. So I will link to all of my other Dune videos down below. I have three other Dune part one, Dune part two, and then I also watched the David Lynch Dune movie, which you said you watched part of that couldn't finish it it was too weird it was too gross the baron like the zit things or whatever i was like this is gross and i will be watching the sci-fi mini series they have dune and children of dune which has uh james mcavoy as leto which oh interesting yeah so i guess he's played by an adult whereas like i said in the book leto is nine years old <laughs> throughout everything but yeah yeah, so I'm curious to see that. So I will have another video coming out once I once I have watched that. It probably won't be till later in March. But yeah, so definitely like and subscribe. Share your comments down below on if you agree, disagree. Share your thoughts on the series, what you think will happen in the next Dune movie. And yeah, and I will go ahead and link to one of the Dune videos on the screen so you can go ahead and get even more Dune content. And thank you so much again to Joe for coming on and joining me and also for getting me to read Dune because I had zero interest, like I said. <laughs> but then wow. he bought me the Dune books for my birthday and he said he wanted to come on and make a video. So that inspired me to read them. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah, well, it's been fun as always. Till next time. Yeah. Keep reading. <laughs>